Uh, yeah, so thank you all for staying for the second talk. Uh, it's given by uh, Scott Armstrong. He'll speak about the uh, renormalization group and homogenization. Okay, so thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm happy to be here. I will talk about um, renormalization group and homogenization. Uh, the trouble for me preparing this talk is there were two things I wanted to talk about, and then I realized sometime last night that I could only really do one well. So um, I'll try to, uh, the, the, the title really comes from the second part, which I'll mention in the last maybe 10 minutes. So it's slightly false advertising, but I'm gonna talk mostly about this work that um, we did uh, mostly during the pandemic with Vlad V. Cole, um, which does, which is about homogenization and, and renormalization in some way. Um, and so let me set the problem up for you. Ooh, there's, a, there's a lot on that slide. Uh, so you have a advection diffusion equation like this. So there's a uh, Laplacian with a kappa in front, a parameter kappa, and there's a vector field B, which is an incompressible vector field. So it's divergence free for every, um, in every time slice. Uh, this is all on the D-dimensional torus, but the, the lower the dimension, the more difficulty actually. So D equals two, we'll, we'll use D equals two um, in this talk mostly. And it, uh, so kappa is a, a very small parameter. You should think of it like 10 to the minus 12 or something. And you should think of the vector field B as being very rough. So if B would be Lipschitz, then what I'm going to say wouldn't be true. So we're going to actually construct a vector field B that uh, such that the solutions of this equation have a certain property. And the vector field that we make will be very rough. And it will have many, many scales, many, many active scales. And somehow we will create a chain between these scales um so that something interesting happens at, at the top scale and so the interesting part is sort of how we make this chain uh connected okay um so this equation is sometimes called a passive scalar equation i learned um that i'm supposed to say that uh in the if you're a person who does fluids so if you're a fluids person this is called a passive scalar equation it's passive because um ordinarily in a fluid equation right the vector field b would be related somehow to the solution beta and they're not, they're totally decoupled. And so the scalar theta that's being advected and you know, that, that satisfies the equation is not coupled to the vector field. So that makes the thing, of course, easier. And it's scalar because ordinarily when you have a fluid equation, this would be the Navier-Stokes equation or something, you have a vector and I just have a scalar. So that makes it also easier, okay? Um, all right, so what is it I'm talking about here? Um, Let's talk about the basic um, estimate that you first, you know, I taught my students in, in PDE one last week. If you have a solution of uh, an equation like the heat equation, you should write the L2 norm down and you should take its time derivative and try to see uh, some decay coming from somewhere. And if you do that for this equation, um, the, the um, advection term just drops out and you get the same estimate that you would have if you just had the heat equation with diffusivity kappa. So you could just, the time derivative of the L2 norm is, is minus the um, uh, kappa times the, the uh, uh, L2 norm of the gradient square. And if you integrate this, of course, then you can see the decay of the L2 norm uh, in terms of this quantity, which is called the dissipation or the, uh, in this case, I, I don't know if I should, the problem is, is there's a thousand different ways to say this, but whatever, the uh, dissipation of scalar variance. I don't want to say the dissipation of energy because this is a scalar, so that's not an energy like it would be if this would be the, the velocity of the function or something. So, uh, but anyway, it's, it's the dissipation of scalar variance. Um, okay, so if B has enough regularity, then you know that this, the solution of the, uh, this should converge to the solution of the transport equation in some sense, in some weak sense, somehow. And so the transport equation um, doesn't change the measure of the level sets because B is incompressible. So that means that this number and um, that these numbers that, I mean, all right, so this and this should be that, and this should be zero as kappa goes to zero because you shouldn't lose any L2 norm, okay? Um, if you do lose L2 norm still in the limit as kappa goes to zero, this is referred to anomalous uh, dissipation or anomalous diffusion um, because it, it doesn't look like um, it should happen because there's a kappa there, right? So because there's a kappa there, that thing should be O of kappa. And if the vector field would be Lipschitz, then that's what, it, then that's what would happen. Um, and you, you may wonder, how can this happen? Because it looks like the vector field had no effect on this calculation at all. So how could it affect? But of course, the vector field uh, affects the solution, right? Because the solution 
is the solution of the equation and there's the vector field in the equation. So the vector field has to somehow affect the solution, make it have wiggles, and those wiggles have to build up somehow so that this number actually stays positive as kappa goes to zero. Okay, and if you think about how that can happen in the equation, uh, what's in the equation? Uh, you have, and, and you assume that you start from some smooth initial data. The equation has a Laplacian, and that's the only thing that can cause the, um, uh, uh, the energy dissipation or whatever. So, and the Laplacian really only acts on very, very high frequencies because of this kappa. So the vector field has to somehow be responsible for taking low modes and somehow transferring uh, those low modes through some sort of nonlinear interaction into high modes that, that the Laplacian can then kill. And so the question is, can this uh, happen? How can it happen? Can you make an example showing that it can happen? So that's the basic question. The vector field's time independent? No, definitely not. I mean, the, uh, you can ask the question if the vector field is time I'm independent, but the vector field that we construct will not be here. Yeah. At least in our theorem, there are some, there are some theorems out there for time independent vector fields, but yeah. There's a probabilistic interpretation, of course. Um, you can instead of thinking about a PDE, uh, you can think about a Markov process or a, a diffusion process, and you can follow around what the the Brownian motion does. And when you think about it from this perspective, you okay, you basically have an ODE except a tiny bit of, of uh, Brownian motion there. How can it be that as kappa goes to zero, um, this thing isn't converging somehow to deterministic paths? Because so the anomalous diffusion would, I mean, the name anomalous diffusion comes from the fact that if if the it's basically equivalent to the thing I have on the previous slide, that the variance of this does not go to zero as kappa goes to zero. Okay. If B was regular enough, it would be, it would be a border uh, kappa. This is also sometimes called spontaneous stochasticity, which is another jargon word, which, you know, this, this, the, that somehow you're going to send kappa to zero and still somehow the, the little infinitesimal kappa that remains was a germ that sparked some spontaneous, some stochasticity to, to, to appear in your, in your system from nowhere. Okay. Um, and these are actually equivalent. Like I said, there's a paper of Drew Goss and, and Eink that proves that. So these, these two pictures are the same. To have spontaneous stochasticity, you have to have the anomalous diffusion for every initial data. Okay, so the 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 real so that's the the PDE side, the probability side. What's, what's the real motivation? Of course, in 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 fluids for turbulent fluids, we expect this to happen at the level of the um, you know here. Now I have my Navier Stokes system, so I have u uh, nu instead of uh, theta kappa. But essentially, the same thing is supposed to happen that. Uh, you should have anomalous dissipation of, of kinetic energy when you have a turbulent fluid. So if you imagine taking the solution of the Navier-Stokes uh, system, maybe you put an F here, which is some, uh, you know, you have to input energy into the system for there to be uh, turbulence somehow. But you stir in, on, you know, some large wavelength, uh, low frequency modes. And, and by doing that, you create all kinds of weird eddies that, that, that on small scales that then cascade down, down, down the scales until they reach the small scale at which the, the Laplacian can uh, kill them. This is the picture of Kolmogorov, and this is called a, 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 an energy cascade. Okay. And the difficulty in proving something like that or, or trying to understand that is it's very, very hard to link all these scales together and create a cascade that really goes down all the scales. Okay, so for physicists, this is obvious, but mathematicians, uh, we don't really have much. Okay, we, we, we can't prove this. Um, Okay. Um, okay, so here's, yeah, so I, I can maybe skip this because I sort of said it in words. Uh, I'll just skip that. Okay, so let me talk about a bit the history of this problem. Uh, there's something called the Kreischen model, which was uh, introduced in 1968 by Robert Kreischen. And basically, he takes a, a, a Gaussian random vector field, which is <laughs> delta correlated in time. So it's, it's no longer a function. It's a vector field, which is its time correlations are, are uh, Dirac, so it's white in time. And, it, and in space, there is some kernel that, that has some decay that can make it be holder continuous for whatever alpha you want between zero and one strictly, but not Lipschitz. And if you have such, if you have this vector field, then it, it, it was realized that you can, and I actually don't understand, the history is very convoluted, but I think in this paper, for example, uh, it was realized that um, 
uh, there's a very simple way to just take the, you essentially take the expectation, apply the Edo formula, and you get a closed equation for the, 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 the two point correlations of the solutions uh, corresponding to this model. And you can compute things. And that allows you to, among other things, show that an anomalous uh, uh, diffusion happens for that model. And you can prove some statistics that are, that are conjectured to occur in uh, turbulence theory. Okay, but this is, however, not really that physical, and it turns out that the white and time um, property of the vector field is actually doing the um, anomalous diffusion for you. That if you if you mollify a little bit, it, we, we're not sure, but it it probably doesn't maintain um, anomalous diffusion. Somehow, the white and time uh, nature of the field is is doing a lot. And if you think about it from the point of view of the particle, if you have a white and time vector field, so at every instant in time, there's an independent direction; it's getting kicked. Uh, you can imagine how that could create uh, diffusion, whereas for a fluid, that's not happening, right? A fluid is continuous in time. There's, there is none of that, okay? So there was recent work, so that this paper is like 2019, but it, somehow the publication date was 2022. But anyway, these were the first um, authors, uh, Drivas, Ogendi, Iyer, and Jong, who, ma who made actually a deterministic example of a vector field, which really exhibits anomalous uh, diffusion, at least for some initial data. You know, for a special class of initial data. And their vector field that they construct comes from treating the equation as a perturbation of the transport equation. If you look at the equation, the kappa Laplacian term is, you know, kappa small. So you may think, why, why not just treat it as a perturbation, follow the trajectories of the transport equation, and then build an example by using sort of uh, vector fields uh, which are known to create mixing. And so the basic example of a vector field which mixes really well is you take a you take um, some initial data which is just some nice smooth um, initial data and the vector field at, on one time scale shears it with a perfect shear and then shears it in the other direction and you find that that maps a uh, kind of checkerboard to a smaller checkerboard and then you repeat that um, iteratively across the scales and so every time interval kind of corresponds to making the, the checkerboard smaller. And then what happens if you add a Laplacian, the Laplacian doesn't really change that too much. It just kind of blurs a little bit the edges of the checkerboard. So you can make your checkerboard <laughs> squares go small, 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 small until the squares are so small that the Laplacian kills it in the last like instant of time. Okay. So that's how their example works. And, okay. So I actually wrote a slide for that. I forgot. Um, based on this example, there were other works on, on this. There's Colombo Crippa Sorella and Delelis. Oh, my, my. That's, that's supposed to be Brue, my uh, auto, uh, my auto spelling uh, correction uh, fixed it for me. Um, these papers take ex essentially the example of this paper and they uh, do different things with it. In this paper is about proving uh, uniform estimates for a scalar, you know, for the, so, so proving the holder regularity of the scalar in terms of the vector field. And in this paper, they add a dimension. They, they take, I think, a 2D example and they put it in three dimensions. So if you take a solution of the passive scalar, you can add a dimension and make it a solution of Navier Stokes with, with a force. And so that's what they, they have done. Um, like I said, in these works, the basic mechanism is that you have um, some vector field that you make that kind of um, is known to mix things up really well. And then the Laplacian acts in, in one instant of time and kills it. Okay, so there is a communication between scales. The scales are being uh, communicated, you know, the signal is being sent kind of one time interval at a time, and it's not uh, the kind of uh, picture that you would imagine should, should happen in, uh, in a fluid where all the scales are being, are present all the time. So what kind of, what kind of uh, advection do they have to these papers? What is the actual vector field? Yeah, I mean, I mean. It, it, so for, on, so for, for, for time it, zero to one half, you yeah. shear. Yeah. And shear. Yeah. And then from time one half to three quarters, you do that again, but but on a smaller scale. Yeah. And from time uh, three quarters to seven eighths, seven eighths to, okay. So it's not it's 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 making a singularity at a final time, kind of with this, you know, the, with a self similar in time kind of a, a repeated. But so that all of these authors are using that that. I mean, the, there's a. I think I haven't. I, I I think they're essentially variants of that idea. Why should you be able to use? Treat the Laplacian perturbatively. I mean, it sounds seems the kind of well. I mean, if kappa is very small, you can follow the trajectories until. I mean, if you look at the the backwards trajectories, like if you look at 
if you follow your diffusion from the probability point of view, and you look at where your diffusion is, I tell you where it is at time t. Can you tell me where it came from? That, uh, that's the question with high accuracy. And until the final time for this checkerboard uh, thing, you, you can actually tell where it came from. At the very final time, you have no idea because somehow the, it, 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 it blurs the checkerboard only at the final time. Okay, but, and so you can follow the trajectory all the way until the anomaly happens. But the, uh, the anomaly is like a Dirac at the final time. Okay, all right, so, um, okay, so there's other works on this. Actually, there's more works I should have quoted because there's more papers that have appeared since I uh, wrote this slide. There's, a, there's I'm just uh, remembering there's papers by Hoffmanova and her collaborators that made the stochastic version uh, using the, the uh, similar vector field and so on. And this slide is about other works that are unrelated, but people may think are related. So let, so let me just skip that, okay? Let's talk about what we would like to show. What we would like to show is that there is that there is anomalous diffusion when you have a solution of, of an obvious Stokes equation that has sufficiently, you know, that is sufficiently turbulent. That if you take a solution of an obvious Stokes equation, that, you know, it, it forces itself, I mean, it's a, it's a solution of, of its own equation, but also if you forced a, a scalar with that vector field that you would see a, um, anomalous diffusion of that scalar. That's what, that's what we'd like to prove. That seems hard. So, and right now we, do, we you know, before this work anyway, we don't have a lot of uh, what uh, Vlad and I consider to be minimally uh, uh, realistic examples. For example, you'd like your vector field to be continuous in time. The vector field that, that makes the checkerboard is only, L, is only L1 in time and things like that. So we set out to make um, an example and we want our example to be, to look kind of statistically stationary in time. So we don't want to create like a singularity at some, at some moment. We want the thing to happen kind of in a, in a more, you know, uh, stationary way. Our vector field is still contrived because we still construct it. Like we build it and say, here's the vector field. And then we prove that it, it does do the diffusion of, um, anomaly. Okay. Um, it, so let me, I think this, is, this should be the theorem statement. So here's the theorem statement. Um, okay, part two is, so part one is, is on the archive. Part two is, is eternally in, in preparation, but hopefully it will come out at some point. Um, so part two, you can um, ignore if you want. Uh, the theorem says that, that for any holder exponent less than a third, and the, the one third is suggestive of fluids, and I think, and there's actually a, a reason for that. I think it's not coincidental that we're at one third. Um, there exists an incompressible vector field, so it's, it's regular with holder beta, beta less than a third, in space and in time, and of course you can interpolate that if you want. And we, and we also have a sequence. This is so we don't have the full sequence of kappas going to zero, but we have a subsequence which is explicit. And the subsequence corresponds to the link scales that we build in the vector field, right? The, the, the diffusivity will give you a link scale at which the, the smallest scale where this interacts with this, like the, the link scale at which the Laplacian kills stuff. And so this has to, these, this sequence of kappas has to correspond to the link scales that we build into the vector field. Okay, because if it gets in, if it lands in between two link scales, we can't control what happens. Um, such that for every initial data, and this sh this should be, yeah, so this should be H1. Okay, we can prove L2, but for now on the archive, we have H1. Then um, the solution of the advection diffusion equation has the um, uh, diffusion anomaly along that subsequence. Okay, and again, between between these this explicit sequence of kappas that we have, we actually don't know what happens. Thing, the thing is completely unknown to us what happens. Okay, it's not, it's not just that we can't prove it, it's that we don't even, I don't even know if it's true. Okay. Are there any questions about the statement? Okay. So there is a contrast between this and the other works that you were talking about, because those are for all couples. No, uh, I don't know, actually. I think they have a, I think they have a sequence too. So, okay. I, I have to check on that. I don't know. Uh, maybe Camilo knows. I, I don't know. Even though you, it's, those results of specific initial data, and they, you think that they also require a sequence of couple. You know, I, can, I, I don't remember. Can, I don't you, can, can you repeat yeah. the question? I have some noise here, and I couldn't hear it very well, actually. Do the, other, do the prior works that I discussed, yeah. uh, just for a subsequence or the full sequence? Uh, no, the full sequence, I think. 
I mean, I think you can engineer you can you can engineer it in such a way that the full sequence does it. I think. Okay. 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 I don't remember. Okay. Um, yeah. So anyway, the the new thing is that it it works for for all data. Okay. So let's see. That that's not yeah. So that's the that's the first novelty in the VRC. And the time the time regular. Okay, so comment the the dimension two is not so I stated it for two D because that's actually the hardest case, but um, the it's the it's it's because you're more constrained in two D. Um, it's it's harder to make a incompressible vector field in low dimensions. Uh, however, it works in, in higher dimensions. In higher dimensions, you have to use uh, I mean in, in two dimensions you can use two dimensional vector calculus with Brad FERP, which is nice. So it makes the notation easier. Um, in three dimensions, you have to use curl, and, if, and in higher dimensions, you have to use stream matrices, which just adds some uh, annoying uh, notation. But other than that, it's the same. The vector field we make has a kind of fractal structure in that we, we do something again and again and again and again um, all the way down the scales. Um, and we, can, and we, we essentially have an expansion for the solution as well between any, any two scales. So if you're willing to understand the solution up to a small error, we can give you a, a very accurate expansion of the solution, which says that the solution has the properties that you think it should have, like you know the active scales in the solution and so on. Uh, for example, you can show the smallest active scale is kappa to the one plus beta, which should be kappa to the three fourths, which is the Kolmogorov um, inertial scale. And there's other um, important scalings that are predicted. So, I mean, as beta goes to one third, it's, it's, it's three quarters, right? I, I hope. Um, and other important scalings can, can be discovered that are in the, the problem as we build it. For example, there's you know, the, um, the Richardson four thirds law for eddy diffusivity is, is also uh, present. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so, the, yeah, so there's prior work, but now there's subsequent work. Uh, paper on the archive uh, almost two months ago now. Where, uh, by uh, Burzak, uh, Shekalahidi, and Wu. And so they have uh, added to our paper, um, essentially. They rerun our construction, and they use the observation that our construction is essentially, the way that we make the vector field, we have a lot of freedom. And if you perturb a little bit the construction of the vector field, it doesn't change the anomalous uh, diffusion proof. And therefore, if you like, you can do a pre-processing step where you can do convex integration on your on your on our vector field construction and make it solve Euler. Our so the solution as we built it already almost solved Euler up to at kind of leading order in some sense, and so you can convex integrate that away and make it zero. And so they have sort of rerun our paper, and but and now the vector field solves Euler. Okay. What happens if uh, beta is above one? Uh, one third. The proof breaks when beta goes above one third. It can't be true. So what, but what is the expectation? The expectation is that I mean, third, it's not true. Okay, so if your thing solves order, it can't be true. Of no, let's forget about yeah. that in the context of your theorem. Our theorem can't be true as we construct it because we're constructing something that is looking like a fluid. So in general, um, in general, um, you can you can have alpha go as close to one um, as you like, like in the Franklin model. Um, to do that, I don't know of any construction that does that regular. Actually, I'm going to get it. I don't know. Keeping continuity of time, of course. I mean, there's 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 many ways to actually to create the diffusion um, anomaly. So I, there's definitely. I mean, the original paper has alpha going to one, um, which, but it's irregular in time. No, no, I'm yeah. saying so. In the context of your theorem, you have a continuous in time and C beta in space. I think you can make. I'm sure you can make it continuous in time. Although I don't know what the latest state of the art is on that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, somebody made an autonomous one in 3D because they made time be the third space dimension. So in 3D, you can do whatever you want because you can make, and then somehow that was C alpha. So in, in 3D, you can, you can make them autonomous. In 2D, I doubt you can make them autonomous. And I don't know in 2D what the, what the limit would be. Um, I'm sure that you can make examples that, that go to one, but how you tie that with the regularity, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so anyway, uh, as I was alluding to, we don't prove this using uh, mixing properties. We don't treat the Laplacian as a perturbation. In our analysis, at every scale that we look at, the Laplacian is in kind of competitive balance with the wiggles of, of the vector field. When you zoom in, 
your Laplacian term is always the same size essentially as the vector field. Now, how can that be? Because the, the Laplacian doesn't change size. Oh, but it does. So the main idea of the proof is that as you zoom out the, the, uh, the scales, the Laplacian term grows and it grows by renormalization because now you replace your equation. You say, okay, I'm gonna forget about these wiggles. We're gonna somehow get rid of them. And in place of the wiggles, the kappa is bigger. Okay, and so you have this kind of dynamical system as a function of the scale. As you zoom out, wiggles in the vector field are erased by some magic process and the kappa gets bigger. And eventually you erase, by the time you go all the way up to the top scale, you've erased all the wiggles in the vector field and you're just left with Laplace times in order one kappa. And that one we know does uh, diffusion, right? It's, it's not even anomalous. Uh, so the idea to do this, um, I mean, the, the honest truth is, is that we, um, we were discussing this, this idea immersed in our conversation. I thought it was really smart because I was completely ignorant and thought that this was a very novel idea. And then we, we found out, we kept finding things that were, that referred to it, to ideas like this earlier and earlier. And we finally found that the idea goes back to the 19th century. So it's not as, as new as we thought, but uh, so it's a very old idea. It's new it, to sort of, I think to, in this, at least in this context to mathematicians, um, at least the making rigorous part of the idea. Um, you can find, for example, if you open the book of Landau and, and Lipschitz, um, you will discover that they explain Kolmogorov's theory in these terms. Uh, for instance, um, the, the, I, I finally discovered the correct thing to Google. Uh, it's not effective diffusivity. You, should, you have to Google eddy diffusivity. And if you Google um, eddy diffusivity, you get all the physics. It opens the, the way that lots of physics papers. But this idea, of course, is, is this sort of renormalization scheme. Uh, has been, there's lots of uh, physics papers which use it uh, in a kind of heuristic and formal way in, in the context of fluids, trying exactly to do the kinds of things that we did. And in fact, if you open the sort of standard book on turbulence by uh, Uriel Frisch, he describes it in very precisely in these terms, basically. Um, and I'll, I'll get to that later if I don't talk too much. Um, to formalize it mathematically is, the, is, is maybe the hard part. Uh, here's a cartoon. So this is this is essentially what happens. The smallest scale is kappa to the three quarters. We have a, we make a sequence of scales. We would like to make the sequence of scales geometric. And if we, if we could make the sequence of scales geometric, then we would be able to not have a subsequence. Okay. So the fact that we we have we have a subsequence is due to this sort of unphysical part of our construction, where between any two scales you don't make it geometric. It's not that this is one one hundredth of that. It's that it's it's a power slightly bigger than one of that, and so it's a super geometric uh, rate down the scales. Um, this little asterisk is saying that. But so if it would be geometric, this would be the picture in log scale. You would see that there's like a straight line basically. Like each little increment increases your um, uh, diffusivity, and the slope of that line is four thirds because that's the Richardson four thirds law uh, in in fluids. And finally, by the time you get to the top scale, you have um, anomalous diffusion. Okay, so now how can how is this working? How can we think about this in terms of the, the stochastic process? And how are we going to actually prove this analytically? Because now the reason for needing the separation, I think the same separation appears in basically all papers on convex integration. Uh, uh, this separation is there because it, it allows when you have a little bit more scale separation uh, with some, some epsilon to the delta, it allows you to, to, to make an error that eventually gets summed up over the scales or producted up over the scales, and it's still finite. Whereas if, I'm, you know, if you make a 1% a error in every, um, uh, between any two scales and there's infinitely many, then you'll lose, of course. So we don't have a good way to do that yet. Okay, so that's the, that's the cartoon. Um, here's the picture, and this is how the, the, the word homogenization comes in. So homogenization is this, sort of maybe boring topic in PDE theory, which takes equations that have little wiggles and have you know maybe random wiggles, maybe periodic wiggles, and says, oh, if you zoom out on a large enough scale, then those, those wiggles are gone and you have a, a deterministic or you know, non-oscillating equation. Um, and usually when this theory is applied, you have wiggles kind of at scale one or at scale epsilon, and you zoom way, way, way out to infinity, basically, and you apply the in, in some infinite scale separation limit. That we can't do because we don't have an infinite scale separation limit. We have two scales, and these are actually definite numbers for us. Like you can compute them from our from our paper. 
Um, they're probably separated by only like 10 to the, the 87 or something. Um, but there, it's finite. So we can't apply some homogenization theorem that works in infinite volume. Um, but it, the, it's, the, it's the same e essential idea. At, at the equation at scale m, a renormalized or at scale epsilon m, uh, renormalized is going to look like this. There's going to be some kappa bar m, which is the uh, diffusivity at that scale. There's going to be the vector field bm, which is just simply the vector field with all scales below eps epsilon m deleted. Like you can think of it as mollify, you just mollify the vector field um, if you want. Or in our construction, we actually construct our vector field in an iterative fashion, putting in scales going down. You just stop the construction at scale epsilon m and don't do anything more. Okay. So the vector field is going to have just a bunch of wiggles. You erase the ones that are below that scale. Um, all right. So what we're going to show is that this equation homogenizes to this equation before you reach that scale. Okay. And if you want to reach exponent one third, you have barely enough room between these scales to do the homogenization. Like the homogenization has a demand on how far you have to zoom out before you see it happen. And the further you zoom out, the smaller the error. But we need most of the homogenization to be done before we reach the scale. And this is where the, this is how the, the beta less than one third happens. Okay. So anyway, this is the picture. Is that, is that clear? Does anyone have any? Questions on that? This is the cartoon. Um, all right, so let me explain how this. That's, that's the cartoon. It doesn't literally happen that way. You have errors beyond that, right? We have errors, but that's that is actually literally the proof. I mean, the proof. There's 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 a lemma. I mean, the paper that says this guy's energy, the the energy of the solution here, the kappa the kappa m uh, a grad beta m squared um, um, integrated guy, and the one for that one are different by something that's very, very small next to their size, okay? And it's really the energy that you want to keep track of, right? So and if you go all the way down the scales, what you do is you, you need to keep their ratio close to one so that you can product over all the scales. And that's what we literally show. Now, the proof that this homogenizes to this is, 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 is complicated, but there's, you know, there's, there's an onsatz. We, uh, we say, well, you know, from the point of view of this equation, uh, this equation, or, you know, from the point of view of this equation, all of these wiggles are constant. Because, like, uh, this guy has wiggles above epsilon m minus one. This guy has wiggles above epsilon m. You zoom into a small box and you look at this equation so that the larger wiggles here are almost like constants, okay? And you only see the, the wiggles on that scale. And in, in that little, you know, on that scale, you can uh, make an onsatz for the solution and you have to make an inductive onsatz that, that propagates that it's, it's, it's um, you know, it takes 80 pages. Um, so let me explain the, um, uh, how, the, how you make the homogenization theory work, okay? So everyone likes to write down the, 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 uh, the advecting vector field. Um, actually, if you open the physics papers, they like to write down the skew symmetric matrix potential for the vector field. Um, when I started doing this, Vlad told me, no, 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 you can't do that. That's not, the fluids community won't, won't, won't like that. But, but I actually think that it's the skew symmetric matrix, which is really the fundamental object. Um, I mean, anyway, if you take uh, an incompressible vector field, just in, in one line, uh, you can write B dot grad theta as the divergence of a skew symmetric matrix grad theta, okay? In 2D, the skew symmetric matrix is just, um, you take this, the stream function, whose grad perp is B, and you make it be, you know, there's only one skew symmetric matrix in 2D, right? So you just put the, that function in, into that matrix, zero psi minus psi zero, and you have your S. Um, and it's this sort of anti-Hermitian property that is going to make the, the kappa get bigger um, in some sense. You know, you have this intuition that stirring, the vector field stirring should increase the diffusivity in some sense. But if you look at it analytically, this anti-Hermitian thing will lift the and necessarily lift the effect of diffusivity. In any case, you can write this like this. This is just kappa identity plus S, okay? And so now we have uh, just a very normal looking parabolic equation, you know, pure second order, no lower order terms. And we can analyze this um, uh, using you know, standard tools of homogenization theory to say that what, what, uh, what it's doing on a larger scale. Okay, and, and we want, to, and we want, so we're just gonna call this thing A and you can just look at it and now it looks like a parabolic equation. Okay. 
Yeah. So anyway, we're going to try to say we're going to try to say that uh, this is happening. That the A is turning into some A bar, and because we're going to make our example kind of uh, isotropic in some sense, the A bar will have to be a multiple of the identity. So it'll just be a kappa bar. Um, and the and I'm going to try to explain now why this symmetric part causes. Okay. And or I'll, I'll, I'll give some examples, actually. Here's an example of one way to think about it. Can you see the vector field? Is it clear? Okay. So if you have a vector field like this, and just imagine it's periodically repeated, okay? And you put a particle there, and you let it spin around, it's going to, the, the vector field is not going to really move the particle far away for a long time until the particle finds itself in kind of the boundary layer between these two cubes. And once it gets there, it can move from kind of being spinning, you know, spinning in this cube to being spinning in this cube. And so it jumps the distance of one, and it will do that as when it gets to a small boundary layer. And the, the small amount of diffusion you have can kind of kick it from one to the other, and then the vector field keeps it of in one. And you find yourself almost doing a random walk on this larger lattice, effectively. And if you look, if you watch this for a long time, the diffusivity itself doesn't really move the particle away from the origin. It's just that the diffusivity allows the particle to jump between the cells and then the random walk actually moves the particle away from the origin. Okay, so the diffusivity is like a, a trigger mechanism for the vector field to like make it go far away, okay? And so we wanna see this kind of thing happen between any two scales so that the small amount of diffusivity that is there is sort of a triggering mechanism for the, a shear flow or something like this to move the particle far away. And then when viewed from a very long, uh, long scale, that will look like a random walk, which will again become a diffusion in some limit, which will then trigger the next scale in this cascade. So it's very hard to imagine that, but that's actually what's happening. Our theorem actually proves that. So the vector field that we actually use, yeah. So is the particle in that example gonna like spend all of its time on this union of circles on the boundaries or is it- No, 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 because the, the, the equilibrium measure is one. So, so I actually have an in animation of this. I don't want to try to play it now, but uh, the particle will, will. So if you put a bunch of particles here, according to the uniform measure, and you propagate this, it'll stay the uniform measure. So because it, it's it, the uh, vector field is divergence free, it's not creating sinks and sources. So they'll just go around, but they'll tip. They'll typically actually they'll spin this way. Sorry, I was going the wrong way this entire time. They'll spin like this, but occasionally one will wander near the boundary just by random chance, and then it can cross and spin there. Right, and so as long as it's in a boundary layer, there, it has some probability of kind of going across the uh, border as it goes around. It's going to move. It's probably move at scale one within each of those things. Yes, it's not trapped near the boundary. Yes, it's going to move by scale one, and the amount of time it spins in this layer. This layer is like has widths root kappa, so it spins. It kind of diffuses with diffusivity one at a proportion of times its root kappa, and so the effective diffusivity goes from kappa to root kappa. Okay. Now, what does the shear flow do? Because this is the one that we actually use. I'm, I'm going too slow. Uh, this is the one that we actually use. This is just going up and down vertically. Okay. This is just a, a very simple one. Uh, what this one does is it goes up for a very long time until it gets close to this edge. And then eventually it'll wander into the other lane and go down with the other traffic. And so you have some, so you can have kind of the horizontal uh, uh, diffusivity affects the the effective vertical diffusivity, and you do kind of a random walk that has very big steps, because when, when you're here, you go up for a very long time, and eventually you switch to the other channel, and then you go down for a very long time, and the length of these steps and how long it takes to switch and so on is, is basically random, so you'll take kind of random steps of a certain length um, in the vertical direction. The horizontal direction doesn't see the, the drift at all, but the, the X2 component here will have a huge increase in the effective diffusivity. And as kappa gets small, it means that the steps you're taking are longer. The, the time switches are, are also longer, but the steps you take are longer. And if you compute, you know, uh, diffusivity is like delta X squared divided by delta T. So if you take steps of size delta X, like on every delta T, then your diffusivity is delta X squared over delta T. And that's, if you do this calculation, you get that. I guess what the next slide says, if I recall. So if you do the calculation, uh, you see that um, the amount of time it takes to switch is epsilon squared um, over kappa. This kappa is the diffusivity, and you have to move yourself epsilon. So it takes epsilon squared over delta amount of time to do that by uh, sort of diffusive scaling. 
And the, the distance you go, well, if the vector field is of order one, then you go, or of order, yeah, I made the vector field be of order, have its Lipschitz norm be of order rho. So the vector field has epsilon rho strength. So its velocity will be epsilon rho, and you'll have it for that amount of time. So you'll go that far. So you're going to take steps of size delta x every delta t. And if you square this divided by this, you see that the random walk will have that diffusivity. But you have to wait this amount of time, which is large if kappa is small, to see it. And you have to wait. And you only see it if you zoom out by this far. OK, so that gives you a constraint. On, how, on when your next scale can come, because you don't want to put your next scale in the vector field, your next larger scale, until this scale has kind of made its random walk into a diffusion. That's kind of an interesting thing that there's smaller kappa leads to a larger diffusivity. Between yeah. Is it's that different from the, the starring one? Yes. It's because the shear flow, kappa being, uh, you would think that it would be monotone in kappa, right? But it's not, because the kappa is actually just a triggering mechanism. So it's just dictating how long the random walk steps are. So smaller kappa is actually inverse. And this kappa being down here means our iteration will have some instability, which means that in order to control our iteration, we need to kind of know what the starting point is. And that's the reason for the subsequence. Anyway, the, the, if you iterate this K, kappa goes to kappa effective, you'll have an unstable iteration, right? OK, so anyway, this is a, a summary slide. The new kappa is the old kappa times this number. That's just, a, I just rewrote it. Uh, this will happen on space scales longer than the old space scale times this number again, but not square. And you'll, ha you'll have it on time scales larger than the inverse Lipschitz constant <laughs> times that number again. So that number is evidently important. It's, it's a parameter that should, you hope is of order one, right? It's just a relation between the kappa on that scale, the epsilon, and the Lipschitz constant of the vector field, OK? And so, yeah, so we're going to, so I'll explain where the beta less than a third comes. Oops. Okay, so the idea is we make a vector field that has all these scales. Okay, it's going to be, it's, it's going to be periodic of period one at the end of the day. Because the scales interact a little bit, the, it's not going to, it's made out of periodic ingredients, but, it, but th this dependence is not exactly periodic because uh, the way that it's built is a little bit complicated. Um, scales below, this should be, this is, wait, so, uh, this is wrong. Uh, this should be kappa to the three-fourths. I don't know why I wrote minus a half. But scales below kappa to the three-fourths don't matter. So, or kappa to the one over one plus beta. So there is some smallest active scale. And if your kappa is tuned to, to the sequence of epsilons, then that will be some epsilon. And we're going to try to homogenize this equation with the epsilon n into the equation with the epsilon n minus 1. So we try to, 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 to erase it. All right. So let's look at the constraints that, uh, that we have. We have the sequence of, of active scales uh, going to 0 and a sequence of shear flow Lipschitz constants, which are going to blow up right? because it's, the vector field is not Lipschitz. It's only going to be holder 1 third to so expect these to blow up. Um, and we have a kind of a recurrence relation between our new kappa. So our new kappa is the kappa on the higher scale. The scales get small as we construct them. But when we do the proof, we start on the small scale and go up in the kind of reverse cascade proof. OK, that's how you have to do renormalization. It's uh, going up the scales. Um, so the new kappa, the one at the larger scale, is the old kappa times this number. That gives us, that's kind of a, I mean, this is just telling us what we have to define. And this is a, this greater than, greater than reflects a need. If we don't have this, our proof won't work because this is the scale at which you, the, the random walk looks like a diffusion again. That's the scale, um, if you want, that homogenization happens. It's a multiple of the previous scale. And we need the scale that has the next set of wiggles to not interfere with that. These wiggles have to look constant all along the homogenization process. Um, otherwise, it, things get messed up. And so we need this to happen, OK? There's a similar thing with the time scales. We need that the time scale of the new wiggles don't interfere uh, with the, the sort of random walk becoming a Brownian motion either. And that, that introduces a third constraint. And if you look at these constraints together and you take out a notepad and you see what, what you can pick for the parameters, like you have some freedom here. Uh, you want to make the epsilon, you know, uh, you, know uh, you want to pick these things in some way that's consistent. 
then you end up with a constraint on these rows that basically tells you they can only blow up, um, like they, they have to, to blow up at a certain speed, they can't blow up too slowly, and that gives you the one third older regular. Uh, I think I wrote them here. So, yeah, so it turns out that uh, if you, you, you make this a relation and ask, um, I'll make Q really small, um, and you can satisfy these two actually for any beta going to one, but because of the one that involves time, you have to use beta less than um, one third. So, yeah. Epsilon M is a super geometric series. It's not yes. saying that. I was saying we'd like it to be geometric, but in our construction, it's not. And that's, and that's artificial. It's not the case that you don't have a separation of scales. You do have a separation of scales that's going to be. No, but yes, but we're not taking a limit there. Yeah. yeah, but still, yeah. You know, in the end, when any two scales have a finite separation of scales, but sure, but you're interested in the limit, and in the limit, that separation goes to infinity. No, the, the separation between epsilon two and epsilon three is, is, is never I changed. Understand, yeah. but it's not the, the challenge is not iterated finitely many times. The challenge is how yeah. when you start piling them up. Yeah, when you start oh, that's right. Up, they're, they're separate yeah, yeah. I mean, the biggest error still comes from the first scale. Yeah, okay. but so you need but you need the, the thing to sum up. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, I can have more to say about that, but uh, yeah, okay, so now let's talk about the actual construction, which is probably how I'm going to uh, finish it. The, the first idea is that, okay, we're going to, so there, there has to be some notation, I'm sorry. Here's the vector field. These are the shear flows. I have two indices. Uh, one index switches between horizontal and vertical shears, because we saw the shear only enhances one direction of the diffusivity, so we have to kind of switch back and forth in time between the two directions so that we enhance both equally. And when you switch, when you change the coefficients in time, you have averaging as opposed to homogenization, right? It's not nonlinear, it's linear. So you can just switch back and forth between two uh, uh, horizontal and vertical shears, as long as the switching gives enough time for each one to really uh, homogenize. And I think that I, the L is just doing this, this parity. Okay, and these are this is a partition of unity to glue together that that parity. Okay, that switching in a nice way, and that's it. Okay, so let's so we're going to do that. Oh, and then, but then we're going to sum over the scales, right? The other um, index is m, is tau m, which does the time scale, and this m does the epsilon. M. Okay, so we have time scales and least scales, and uh, glue together like this in time, and then we're going to sum over all the scales and and see if that works. The problem is this doesn't work. Uh, it can't work. It doesn't work because, <clears throat> okay, if you have a, if you look at that shear flow picture where the particle is kind of following, um, if you want the level lines of the stream uh, function for the shear, if you introduce a kind of constant background drift and it, it, that is like larger than the size of, the, of that shear, then the particle will, will just follow that constant background and it will go across all of those channels and it won't stay in the channel for a long time and you'll get no enhancement. Okay, and, and from the point of view of a small scale shear, if there's larger scales in the problem, those larger scales will look like constants. And so the, the large background just erases the small scales and you have this sort of interference of the, the, the sort of cascade you're trying to set up and you, you just can't do it. Okay, so this, so this, this uh, won't work. So we, we need a way of making these scales embed into the problem without this happening, without this sort of nonlinear interaction between the scales kind of messing up the enhancement that we want to make. So what should you do? You should advect the small wiggles by the slow, larger wiggles. So the way that the construction works now is this. We do what I said, but only for one scale. Then we compute the flow. Okay, then we put the next scale is the previous scale plus the, the new scale, but composed with the inverse flow. The reason for doing this is now that the, now we, the new high, higher frequency wiggles are being advected by the old vector field. So they don't really see those wiggles. I mean, uh, they're like a bug swimming kind of in a river as the river flows down. Okay, so the, from the point of view of the bug swimming, it doesn't know that it's flowing down the river. Uh, it can see like, like if you spin a little eddy, the eddy will spin as it flows down the river. That's actually what a fluid does, right? If fluids do that, that's actually what the fluid equation says, is that the fluid invects itself. 
Um, so we, we, in order to solve this problem, which arose because our, you know, our idea was broken and the homogenization didn't work, uh, we had to make the thing look like a fluid. But we had to, we were forced to. Okay. So um, anyway, this, this feature of composing with the Lagrangian flows causes uh, a cascade of problems in the, in the proof because uh, you lose control of, o over all kinds of things. You no longer have flows that are nice and time independent. You have flows that are uh, at being infected by the previous scale and they're moving around and, and there is some distortion uh, that happens. And so to control things, you have to basically like propagate uh, an, uh, analytic estimates and even to make, even to show that this vector field is well-defined uh, is, is annoying. Uh, and it is, it, it's this, this is actually, the fact that you have to do this is finally where the beta lesson author comes because that, that's what, it, that's what introduces the constraint on the time scale. Uh, maybe I'll speed, I'll, I'll speed this along. Okay. So I'm going to skip that. Okay. So anyway, this, uh, going back to the, uh, where this idea came from, we, we opened this book of Frisch and we found this, this thing about how, how it's a very old idea that goes back to uh, Boussinesque. Um, and, and you may wonder why, why it wasn't this done before. And the thinking was this, I think. The, according to Frisch, you can't, you can't make a proof like this work. Uh, he actually even mentions homogenization theory and discusses some mathematical work in this chapter of his book. Um, but he says that, that you can't make the proof work if there's no clear separation of scales. Okay, so we cheat a little bit. But we still have a problem of a lack of separation of scales. Like we're not taking, we can't take our construction and take a limit of the, the, the distance between any two scales being separated, right? That has to stay fixed. And this is, what create, this is what creates the difficulty of the problem and why he says, I mean, I think regarded by some means uh, regarded by the author, I think, uh, is that this sort of renormalization approach is, a, is pedagogy, uh, or at least this, this analogy that, that you should think of it like in analogy with kinetic theory, because you, you don't have a, a scale a separation. Um, my late colleague, Andy Midas, says the same thing uh, in, in a paper here. And he says the difficulty in applying this, and he wrote a whole kind of book almost. I mean, this is like a 300 page article. I don't know if you call that a book or not, but he, he you know, if you look at all the, the, the section titles, it looks like there should be a proof of a theorem like this in there and you open it and there just isn't. Um, there's other stuff, but there's not a proof of this. And again, he says there's, the problem is there's no clear separation of scales and it's very difficult to, to prove it. So I think our contribution is unfortunately not that, that this idea that you should think of it as a kind of a, a dynamical system through the scales or something like that. Because that, that, uh, that was well known. Our contribution is that you can actually make the proof. You can actually write down the proof and get the proof to close. Um, and we hope that um, this is not just a, we think that it's not just a proof, like a one-off proof of, of a construction, but we hope that we can actually create a kind of more robust uh, renormalization uh, theory that could handle, that can make this proof work on vector fields, which are actually random. Uh, you know, uh, maybe given by NSPDE and things like this. Uh, and so that's what, that's one of the things I'm, I'm working on now. Um, the reason that we, that we use periodic ingredients in this paper and that it's not already a random vector field, because, you know, I do random homogenization. I don't really like periodic homogenization that much. Uh, the reason that I, that we built it like that is because in periodic homogenization, we have very good estimates because it's very easy. And in random homo uh, homogenization, we have very bad estimates. Um, and and the and I mean estimates kind of as a function of the the contrast of the problem. In this problem, we had a small diffusivity parameter and this vector field. And I said that at any scale you look at, they're kind of in an even balance of competition. But it's not quite true. The vector field was still a little bit stronger by an amount that was big. And the bigness of the vector field uh, causes you to have to use very sharp estimates uh, in, in homogenization theory, which are only available when you have um, periodic fields. And in, in the random case, we have terrible estimates. And so the work that I was gonna describe in the last 10 minutes, which I guess I will not, is uh, about making a theory of homogenization, which is able to, to do that in the random case. But I can talk to you about that after your questions, and I guess I'll stop now. 
And thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much for the great talk. Uh, any more questions? Um, what? Uh, this may be separate from what you discussed, but if I, you were describing with this uh, renormalization and validation picture as like an alternative point of view on the anomalous diffusion, like is there can you, uh, any simple way to describe what the like usual view is and how it's different? Um, hmm. It depends on on usual by whom, by physicists, by mathematicians. Um, I, I think that for mathematicians, the idea that you, you, I mean, it's too bad Camilo is, is now, I think he had to board his plane. Um, I think for mathematicians, the idea that the proof like this works was a surprise. Yeah. Um, I think that for physicists, I don't think they care about proofs. And the idea that uh, renormalization group methods should work to understand turbulence is maybe controversial. I mean, it's like uh, Frisch said, is that it's, um, I mean, if you open his book, he says, you, you could never make this rigorous, but there's, you know, you, you have your choice between not being able to prove it or making heuristic arguments, which are not valid, but it gets some insight is kind of what he says. And so I think that, and there, I think there have been some attempts more recently since that, that his, his book was written to make renormalization group um, by physicists, you know, work for turbulence. And um, I'm told that, that, that it's not mainstream. So how do they usually do turbulence? They don't. I mean, I think that, yeah, I mean, I, we don't really. So there isn't like another calculus to get these. Stuff. We have only a, a phenomenological theory. I mean, we have Komogorov saying that by these scalings, this should happen. But there's not even a physical, I mean, it's right. It's like there's some simple scaling argument, but there isn't like a. There's a scaling argument, but there's no even physical uh, explanation, really. I mean, we know there it has to be some cascade, right? There has to be. Uh, there's 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 conservation of energy, and if you're pumping energy in at this scale, it can only go out at the scale, so it has to get there somehow. And you can see it experimentally, but I think that that it's not understood. Um, I mean, there's these 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 Krishnan models um, where they they can write down this Gaussian field and do some calculations and say, oh, that shows that it, that this is happening. But so you're saying that's not actually a description. No. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe somebody has, I mean, if, if I don't know if Tom agrees with that, but Tom must have an opinion, but uh, that's what, I, I don't know if, if, I mean, you know, Feynman in, in the 80s tried to work on turbulence and gave up, and so it's, it's kind of, um, I don't know. Any more questions? So, this construction, the construction of the vector will be you don't actually have stationarity in time. It's not, I mean, not it's, it actually it's periodic in time. But if you zoom in at a certain scale, it has all the other scales mixed up and it's not going to exactly be periodic on that scale. I mean, it can't be periodic at every scale, right? So there has to be something going on. Um, but yeah, I mean, these things are, are all uh, negative powers of two. And you, you saw how we made it. We start with a periodic guy, we compute the flow, which is periodic. We make another periodic guy, but then we put the inverse flow and then we use cutoff function. It, it, it's actually all periodic. Um, but if you look at it at a certain scale, there's a bunch of different things happening at that scale. It can't be periodic at, at scale epsilon m because there's epsilon m minus one above it. Well, what I mean is that if you look at, let's say, on the period, mm -hmm. uh, the front flow, the construction is very, very inhomogeneous within that period because first you put very high oscillations, then you go to the larger scale, larger scale, and larger scale. And at the end of the period, you, have, you, you get to the larger scale. That's just built in the construction. I mean, if you would take the vector field and you would zoom into it to one of these active scales, you would think you're looking at a periodic function. You would only see that it's not periodic if you are zooming out enough that you start to see the other scale. So, yeah. The way this all the scales appear, they there is no translation of variance in time. Right, only on the largest scale. It's it's literally one periodic, but not half periodic. Yeah, because they're right. I mean, yeah. If it would be translation invariant, you'd have to be a multiple of all the sc the scales. So, uh, can you just say one word? So, <clears throat> you said that. So when you go from one scale to another, you produce. Okay, if you don't take into account, if you just look at the simple example. Um, of uh, how you go from one scale to another, then it looks like you have a high contrast situation. Mm -hmm. Now, in reality, your scales are arranged in such a way that the 
you actually don't have a high contrast. You do, but it's not that bad. It's epsilon to the minus power. So the difference is actually uh, uh, is actually big. It's yes. The, the, uh, the, because okay, because you did the super geometric thing, that solved one problem. It caused another problem. The problem it causes is now you've given up. I mean, you have a certain number of rooms in uh, room in the scales. If you skip a scale, you just gave up your chance to make enhancement happen. Mm -hmm. So in order to compensate, you have to turn the other vector field way up in, in amplitude. And that causes you another problem, which is high contrast. Mm -hmm. And so it's like everywhere you go, you, you so it, it, that now you have a high contrast problem. And the contrast, okay, it's not big, like it's not epsilon m to the minus 10, it's epsilon m to the minus a small number, which depends on the Q of the scale separation. And you hope that the scale separation and the, and that's actually where everything is, is, is it's like you have, you know, two scales which are kind of close, and is the contrast? It's it's also big. Is it enough? And you're playing this game of trying, and you barely squeeze it. Yeah. So this is the problem that you were mentioning that uh, that would appear if you try to do the the random homogenization. So what's happening here is that because we have the super geometric scale separation, we're essentially completing homogenization between any two scales. That's not really what happens physically. What happens physically is you you need to define coarse grained. Uh, co you know, uh, coarse grained um, uh, diffusivities, you know, maybe in a box, and you need to see this co very complicated dynamical system play out. So that you're never homogenized. It's not like, oh, now you've homogenized, start over. It's actually, you, you actually literally watch it go. And that's very, very complicated. And we think we can do that now, but uh, it, it, there are details. And, you know, it's, it's um, we have a way to do that um, in the random case. Yeah. So we can. We can homogenize infinitely many random scales um, as long as you may need to. It won't be as, as good yet as the periodic case, because, and you'll, but you may be able to use that techniques in this case to, to get around the super geometric scales, I think. But you, the, it would be another 200 pages to write or something. But I, I think that it's possible to, to do it. But yeah, so we, we think we know how to do that, but it's still, um, I mean, I've been thinking about that for a long time. I can tell you more. Any questions? When you say you had this, um, is the like a super exponential separation like you know as small as you want, or in some like fixed? You range? need it to be small. Yeah. So you you just write down you 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 just pick a q, and you say that this is one plus q, and q is going to be like you know ten to the minus two hundred or something. Yeah. So there's some maximum amount of Q you can take and you can get You need some Q, but you actually want Q to be as small as possible. I mean, th there's going to eventually be a constraint on Q, which is going to tell you, you know, what beta has to be for it, there to be a, a possible Q that fits all the constraints. And that beta, that constraint is beta less than one third. Yeah. And, and it's sharp for this construction. I mean, the fact that you can modify the construction a little bit and make it solve Euler shows that it, it's definitely sharp. You know, like you can't improve that. So with, you know, proving this theorem for beta smaller than one third is, 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 is easier. Like you, to prove beta to one third, you have to be, um, you know, you have to go to infinite order and in all your expansions and stuff like this. Like you can't, you can't ever stop it at a finite order in your approximations. Okay. So can, can you think intuition why so if if the separation is too small, then just homogenization doesn't happen between the scales. Yes. But what is going to go wrong if Q is large? Like if the separation is... Like if Q is large, you will waste your scales. And, and you won't create enough enhancement. Let me ask one last question. Mm -hmm. So just to understand the difference a bit better between the CT0 and the LT1 case. So you talked at the end kind of about this background field that's causing difficulties. So if I just, uh, like this background constant vector field yeah. that we get from the larger scales. So if I wanted just an LT1 result, like the one that's been proving earlier, could I avoid this just by putting all of this at different times? Um, I mean, you could avoid all of it with a much simpler construction, right? You okay. could just use their their shear flow construction. Okay, but if I just put like your construction and put like the different spatial scales at different times? No, because, well, okay, so let's, so let me think. Uh, you want to put the, 
You want to because your problem is like they overlap in time, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, would that work? Yeah, I think probably yes. I think that there's a way to. I mean, you can always, if you want to use. I mean, one way to think about it is that if you look at our, if you look at the limiting dissipation measure or whatever that is, like you know, the uh, the L2 norm is going to drop. In our paper, it drops continuously. There's dissipation at all times, but you can ask like, what is the what, what, what is the, the support of that measure in one plus d dimensions? Our construction will get like d plus one minus epsilon. Okay, and if you if you are willing to lose a whole dimension in time or by using the x three coordinate, it's much easier to make the construction because you can use that dimension as as your sort of dummy that switches things, and then it's much easier. Yeah. Any last questions for Scott? Okay, so let's uh, thank you again.